each. Thank you very much, Helena. So welcome. Uh, welcome to Modelon uh, vendor session and uh, together with my colleagues. We have prepared for you uh, four topics to talk about. So I will start with Modelon Impact, our platform. My name is Yiri Navratil and I am responsible for Modelon libraries and their content. I am here in behalf of uh, Johan Windal, who apologizes and he couldn't join us uh, today. So let's jump into our platform, Model on Impact. So I believe uh, most of you have already heard about it. And basically this is our platform and uh, we kind of built it on three goals. We really believe that the system simulation software can be used by anyone. So that's uh, how it is designed. Then now in the pandemic, post-pandemic days, uh, the collaboration is really important. So uh, the tool is designed uh, to be easy used for collaboration with colleagues, uh, friends maybe, and also customers. And we mustn't forget about uh, accelerated uh, decision-making with uh, high confidence. Then our platform is built up on four uh, main pillars. The first one is all around user friendliness because to become productive, it's really important to be able to uh, act quickly and get the answer quickly. It's based uh, on the web uh, browsers, so it's possible to run it from the web. And then second one is about the content. Uh, we provide our modern libraries uh, in this tool. And since our modern heritage is, uh, really uh, belongs to the libraries, we have something to offer there. Of course, uh, content and tool uh, would be uh, nothing without the powerful solvers and compilers. So that's uh, why we equip that with a dynamic and steady state capabilities. And then uh, we don't want to forget about our users, about myself, you. Uh, we basically would like to make sure uh, that anything which is your uh, IP, your code, or maybe your tools, can be easily connected uh, to our platform. So I will repeat, uh, this is our company, uh, company vision. We'd like to make sure that the system simulation is for everyone. And maybe I'll try to explain it uh, on one of the examples. So let's imagine we do have three, let's say very experienced uh, users and maybe programmers. And then uh, they can prepare and design the tool uh, and platform for others uh, to be able to use it in uh, different uh, industries uh, at a different fidelity level. And also it, uh, those, the, the others doesn't, uh, they do not have to be uh, experts in that field. So they might be uh, sales guys, commercial guys, maybe managers like me. So uh, we really believe this tool is for anyone and uh, the customization helps to spread its usage, not only globally, but also to different, different people. And it's important, uh, once it is spread out, it's important to get the answers really quickly. So historically, if you take a look at the left side of the screen, uh, programmers, it usually takes them uh, years, maybe months, uh, to put together uh, the software tools. Thanks to Modelica and FMI uh, Open Standards, uh, we are able to uh, build up, or we were able to build up the content, the libraries, which is in the middle, and then the tools uh, uh, running or accepting the Modelica language uh, can very easily be used uh, for drag and drop and building the models. But this is not enough. We, are, we said uh, we go one step, uh, one step up, and it's about, uh, about customization, and it's, it's about, let's say, web apps. So we can design easily web apps where we can show just only the important inputs and outputs, and then the tool or the web app can be used basically by anyone who it is designed for. We uh, believe uh, in the user friendliness, and we want to make sure it's user friendly and easy uh, to create models. So uh, we can go from the kind of top level, uh, seeing the big picture, down uh, to the models uh, itself, sub models. We can see the code, and of course, the cloud uh, native uh, helps, uh, especially on the web. 
then uh, we also believe uh, in experiment. Uh, so it means uh, that it should be, or it is easy to set up uh, and customize the views, may, maybe predefine some plots, stickies, run uh, different experiments uh, dynamically, or steady state, which is uh, one of the futures. Then uh, deployment. I have been also, I have been mostly talking about the model centric view, which is on the left side. And then uh, this is basically what I would say most of us are experienced if most of us know. But then uh, there are also other options uh, allowing to spread uh, the applications around. And the, in the middle, uh, we can see a notebook view. The notebooks, uh, they, uh, we can predefine their cells with steps and the uh, users can go through the inputs, uh, running the simulations, multi-simulations, then uh, post-processing, plotting, maybe exporting, and all can be done in uh, sequence. So it, they're ideal for automated workflows. And then I have already talked a bit about the custom view about the web apps. Uh, so let's say uh, this uh, web app for EV car, uh, I can very quickly from drop down menu, select different batteries, uh, maybe uh, uh, different inputs, uh, additional inputs, and then I can get the trade-off between the range and um, uh, the battery size. And uh, I would say that now I should talk about a lot of plenty new features which we have developed in the last one and a half years. Because I believe the last time uh, we have been talking at uh, the conference, Modelica conference, about this was one and a half years ago. And uh, we got three releases in the meantime. So I, if you don't mind, uh, please visit our websites and uh, there, the new features are listed there. I would highlight uh, only those really top ones mutually, and then I will let my colleagues to show uh, some of the examples of them. So the first one is uh, the 3D view. So we now support 3D view, uh, so it's nice and available and visible. Uh, second one is we can import FMUs, co-simulation FMUs. So we can have one, two, three on the canvas, we can run it. Then uh, next one uh, would be uh, improvements in the responsiveness. So everything is much slicker, faster. We have also improved the code editor uh, to allow the um, uh, library development. Plus also we improved the post-processing. And with that said, uh, I will pass uh, the presentation to Michael Zielman, who will kindly talk about aerospace. Yeah, hello. Uh, nice talking to you also from my side. On the next slide, you will see that I will be first talking about our aerospace portion of our library suite. This is our set of libraries that are available on all leading Modelica platforms. Uh, so obviously on model on impact that you just heard about, but also on the so system Daimola, DBM and Ansys Twin Builder, for instance. I will first give you some news about the different libraries and the different uh, verticals, and then talk about one specific type of workflow uh, that is being enabled by Model and Impact as a, as a platform. The first one uh, that you can see here is our thermal and fuel management vertical. Most notable change here is that we're now able to model any type of fuel tank also those that require multiple liquid levels to represent the physics properly. So in the middle of the screen, you can see one example, one tank. The gray transparent portion is the tank shape and the blue part is the liquid level as we're emptying the tank. And you can see that the fuel being extracted on the left hand uh, only extracts the fuel obviously then from the left. Uh, cavity and the fuel level on the right cavity at some point uh, remains constant. On the next slide, uh, on the actuation and the landing gear vertical, uh, you can see that one uh, big extension in the hydraulics library is that we can now use an extended oil cavitation model which uh, poses balance equations both for the gas and the liquid volumes and then has some consistency equations relating them to each other. And with that, you can uh, model more accurately the, the transients of those, those systems. In the propulsion and power 
vertical. Um, there were new models available to estimate not only the performance, but also the mass and the geometry of components in jet propulsion library and electrification library. So you can use those for components to predict um, the, the size and the masses. And uh, in jet propulsion library, we have implemented uh, these workflows for multipoint design. Uh, this is something being enabled by the steady state physics-based solving technology that Yeji mentioned a little earlier. And we'll be seeing a few more details about that in the, the second part of this aerospace presentation. On the aircraft dynamics and performance vertical, uh, we've worked a lot to make it easier and more seamless to integrate models, build uh, to represent different physical domains. Uh, so facilitating this multi-physics integration, uh, be it that you want to integrate the thermal and fuel management piece, the actuation and landing gear or the propulsion pieces, all of that, bringing all of that together is, is much uh, easier and much more powerful in, in the latest versions. And with that, um, we leave the library news on the aerospace portion of library suite, and we look a bit more at workflows. So as I said, Model, in, model on Impact as a platform is enabling additional workflows. And um, I, I would like to introduce one uh, early design workflow here. It really builds on this notion of on design modeling, which is uh, let's say uh, different to how we know modeling in Modelica typically. So we're not entering all our component sizing parameterization as an input and then computing our performance, but the, the sizing, the parameterization of the components is actually an output. So we really need to prescribe component level assumptions, uh, system level assumptions, such as pressure ratios, shaft speeds, and then we're generating a consistent design on a specific operating condition that we call the design point. On the next slide, we see that this obviously then goes hand in hand um, with uh, what is called off-design modeling. So if you have your one single operating condition that defines the sizing, you want to evaluate the performance on other operating conditions. Uh, so you prescribe your flight level, uh, ambient conditions, et cetera, and then predict uh, how, how the system operates um, this is closer to the to the classic notion of modeling and, and, and modelica, I, I would claim. But all of them are really used in uh, industry and practice a lot. And on the following slide, you can see uh, that for industrial scale problems, you also have one additional challenge that you want to solve, um, then leading to this notion of multipoint design um, in yeah, more complex problems. You really cannot express all your uh, requirements towards the design on a single operating condition, uh, but you want to do that also on other uh, normally off design conditions. So, in this framework of the multi point design being enabled by model on impact and physics based solving, you can really do that for uh, any cases. And you see that on the bi directional information flow uh, in the middle. Um, the component sizing is fed into the off-design models and you can implicitly prescribe uh, some design choices there. On the following slide, yeah, we can see uh, what such models look like uh, in a Modelica authoring tool. Um, you really just have instances of your uh, plant model at different operating conditions. Um, as all of this builds on this very established notion of design point and off design computations. Uh, we also have one off design, uh, sorry, one on design instance here and several off design models. And we can see how they're coupled to each other on the next slide through these utility blocks. They really contain uh, design rules, operation rules on how you want to ensure the consistency of the design and how you want to operate on, on the different cases. 
So in a nutshell, this is the high level context in which we're implementing this workflow. And this slide here summarizes the main steps of the, the workflow. And these steps, they're really enabled by what, about, by what we just heard about from Yeji about the different views that, that we support in Model and Impact. You have the model-centric view, which is your drag and drop graphical modeling environment. You have the notebooks and you have the web app view. And the first three steps that are highlighted here in orange, they're implemented uh, in an interactive way in this model-centric view. So you start creating your single point model uh, with drag and drop. You just uh, select the different components representing electric machines, compressors, and so on. You connect everything together. In the second step, uh, you run uh, simulations on a normal single point model, be it on design or off design. And you look at your results, uh, name them appropriately, uh, such that you can reference them later on. And in the third step, we generate with tool support and converge uh, the first multi-point model. And that works by reusing the previous single point results from the second step. Um, so the tool collects that data from a database of results from the single point model, assembles that into a guess for the multi-point model and converges that model interactively. And then if we have that, we can go off and trigger automated analyses. And you can see that in the last two steps with the, the bluish color, uh, you can run your um, design workflows in notebooks, or you can uh, leverage all this from, from web apps. Now to wrap up, uh, we have two, two more things. Uh, this is a graphical view of what the third step looks like in the tool. So you can see that uh, you can enter all the data on the references uh, for the results that you want to reuse uh, in, the, in the graphical interface and, and run this from here um, in, a, in a neat way with these custom functions. So they're really Python functions that you can leverage from the, the user interface. And then the last slide that I have today, we can see some exemplary results. So this is a hybrid electric uh, gas turbine. To the left, you can see a cut view of the engine. Uh, so you can see the flow path going through the compressors, the combustion chamber, and the different turbines. With that arrow highlighted, you see that there is an electric machine being installed there. And around that, we see the bypass flow. So we can get some geometry. We can get the masses data that you see to the right. And with that, I will pass on the baton to my colleague, John. John, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Bate. I'm the Director of Engineering Services at, at Model on Inc. And I'll walk you through some of our uh, automotive solutions. So as, as Michael mentioned, our automotive library suite consists of a number of libraries, again, available on leading Medellica platforms, certainly uh, Model on Impact, as, as Michael mentioned, but also uh, Daimler and Twin Builder. So um, you'll see as we go through and, and we look at a couple of different applications, you're going to see uh, some workflows executed in, in different tools. So. so a couple of highlights on, on the library side. Um, in many cases, uh, we haven't had vendor sessions, at least at the Medellica conference since 2019. So this is kind of a high level view of, of some highlights in the libraries uh, since then. Um, uh, a couple of uh, advancements in the electrification library. Uh, we have added validated battery models from Remac that are readily available in the electrification library. Those models are, are validated and, and ready to use. So you can drop them into your simulations. In addition, we've added AC machines and AC-DC uh, inverters to the electrification library. Those components al always existed, but more in a, in, a, in a map sense. And I'll show you moving forward um, the kind of AC capability that we have now that's been added. Um, in addition, a, a vehicle dynamics is now integrated with the electrification library. So those two uh, libraries are, are provided together and there's some new uh, nice electric vehicle examples, uh, an electric pickup and an electric coupe. Um, you can see those, uh, the animations of those models shown uh, on the left. Um, in addition, vehicle dynamics library is now VI certified. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. That means you can export your models into uh, VI grade simulation platforms. 
We don't want to forget the thermofluid side. We've had lots of new advancements in our, in our various thermofluid libraries, air conditioning, vapor cycle, liquid cooling, heat exchangers, new components, uh, new vapor injection compressor to support some new applications that we're doing, new expansion valves, always robustness improvements and, and some new system examples as shown below, like for, the, for our heat pump. And one big advancement for our thermofluid libraries, before we move on to the next slide, is, uh, is analytic Jacobians. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit. That's uh, enabled uh, robustness improvements and, and pretty substantial runtime improvements. So. This first uh, example that I want to talk about is, is vehicle steady state analysis. Uh, this is a very common thing for, for kind of fingerprinting your vehicle. And uh, we have some, uh, we've always had some quasi static experiments in, in vehicle dynamics library. Uh, but now what we can do is use those uh, same quasi-static experiments, but with, um, with IMPACT's steady state solver. So we can run real steady state analysis. Uh, we can pick which variables we want to iterate on, which residuals we want to satisfy. So we can, um, custom, we can uh, simulate our vehicle performance. So you can get things like are shown on the upper right, the uh, handling diagram, which shows you the the uh, vehicle center of gravity is a, fu a function of the, ex uh, the chassis acceleration. So with steady state capability, uh, it's much easier to do this kind of fingerprinting and, um, and, and get these answers much faster than uh, what was possible before without a steady state solver. And this is implemented as a custom function in, um, in, in model on impact. And if you're interested, there's a, a blog post that, that talks about this application in, in a bit more detail from my, from my colleague, Peter. Um, similar uh, to the vehicle analysis, we can also do steady state suspension analysis. So again, what we're doing here is, is prescribing uh, inputs and, and solving the suspension vehicle in steady state. So we give it things like wheel travel and steering input. And then from steady state solution, you can get things that, that could help you create reduced order models and polynomials for the, uh, for the chassis. You can get characteristics like toe and camber as a function of wheel travel. Uh, you can generate uh, polynomial and, and, and table-based suspension models uh, using this capability. Again, capability that we had before, but certainly much easier to do when you have a, a true steady state solver and you can get your answers out much more quickly. And as, uh, as UG mentioned, we, we do have animation and impact. So this is just a, a couple of uh, nice pictures of, of different simulations uh, animated and impact. Uh, trucks, uh, motorsports on a, on a four post rig. And then uh, just in case you forget that what a vehicle, uh, if we think what a vehicle could be, um, we also had done some uh, simulations of the, uh, of the new Mars Rover and impact. And that's, a, that's an animation of, uh, of that vehicle. So the word vehicle means a, a pretty wide range of things for us uh, in terms of our library capability. Uh, I mentioned before that we've added uh, true AC machine capability and in inverters and in, in, uh, in electrification library. Um, this slide shows some details of that, how those models are structured, um, what you see underneath the machine in terms of being able to specify various submodels. Uh, as part of this, the uh, inverter and machine interface has been uh, separated so that we can have uh, separate components for those two. Um, we also added both uh, discrete and switched inverters to, to support AC applications along with the averaged inverters that we had before. Uh, we have machine models of common three-phase electrical machines, and there's also examples. Um, and we can, uh, we can do, uh, from the numerical side, um, calculation of individual phases or use the DQ0 transformation for the AC machines to really improve the... Uh, uh, the computational performance of, of these uh, fluctuating three-phase machines. So what you see in the simulation is not just lots of squiggly lines as the individual currents in the machine, um, and also showing you the currents from the uh, transformation um, from a uh, simulation with a, with a short circuit to deal with a fault. So um, while the machines we had before were fine for kind of more, you know, uh, higher level analysis, we, we've seen that people uh, want to come to electrification library and also do really detailed analysis on the machine side. And so um, adding AC machines in a, in a true AC way is, has helped us meet those, uh, meet those demands. Uh, another application that I wanted to highlight is uh, battery pack uh, simulation. So we've added uh, statistical distributions into our battery pack formulation. So 
it's very easy to um, to provide a, a statistical distribution, say from a, a Monte Carlo sim like shown here into your model and then run lots of sweeps where you can vary parameters. So this particular simulation uh, gives variations in some of the battery pack parameters and looks at the uh, charging performance for the battery pack as a whole. And of course, as you apply your statistical distributions, your charging performance will vary over a range. And then you can look at the distribution and see um, how many of those uh, combinations are, are ones that would meet your, your performance spec. Um, this model was, uh, is, is a model from electrification library, but it's actually being executed by a, a Jupyter notebook using, uh, using the Python client that's available in, in model on impact. So here you can uh, run lots of cases and, um, and spawn them in, in parallel and look at the results. Uh, these, these, uh, this case was run just on a desktop, but obviously as you're, as you're in the cloud, you can spawn lots of cases and, and really cut down on the, the time it takes to, to get these answers back, especially when you're doing um, uh, distributions like you would do in a, in a Monte Carlo sim. And then the last application that I wanted to highlight is, uh, is vehicle thermal management. This is an application we've been uh, kind of heavily involved in for many years with our, with our various libraries. Um, uh, we do this work with, with several OEMs. This model is, is not one from them, but just one that I wanted to highlight because it, it shows you the, the kind of capability that, that we have. Um, if we go uh, one animation forward, you'll see that the heart of this model is, uh, is a couple of different loops, uh, an, an advanced refrigeration loop, including a coolant part, a, a coolant loop that includes a battery model, and also uh, an air loop model that includes the cabin. So what we're really trying to do is, is model all of the important thermal loops um, in, the, in the vehicle system. Um, you know, the AC system is no longer just for climate. It's, it's got responsibilities for cooling the battery. And as soon as we bring that in, then we need to have the appropriate uh, coolant system models, including battery thermal models to, to support that integrated analysis. And if we want to look at trade-offs between performance on cooling of battery and cabin, then of course we need an air loop that, that can include a, a cabin model. And I'll show you some results from that in a second. Um, and if we advance one more to, to make these systems run, we obviously have to control them. And that's, that's one of the important um, outputs from, from an analysis like this is, is looking at different control strategies for say the compressor, uh, the coolant flow rate, uh, impact of, of ambient conditions, impact of set points on, on system performance. And so here we have an integrated view of the entire thermal management from a top level. You can see the pH diagram on the upper, uh, upper right uh, for the refrigerant system that will animate as the simulation runs and, and various visualizers throughout the system to, to pull out uh, key outputs as a function of time. And then what do we get from analyses like this? So if we advance to the next slide, uh, you'll, you'll see some of the key outputs. So this is, uh, this is a simulation that's, that's running a pull down test. So, so the cabin is hot and the, uh, the goal of the system is to bring the cabin down to a cool temperature and, and to see how long that takes. Um, in advanced uh, refrigerant systems, it also in include the ability to run uh, chillers in parallel. Um, there's obviously an impact of, of having to run the chiller to cool the battery. So this simulation shows uh, two different pull down traces for the cabin. Uh, the blue one is, is one that came where there was no requirements to do any battery cooling. And then the red one you can see um, is one where the battery needs to be cooled. The battery temp is shown on the inset plot. So it starts off, we heat the battery around 200 seconds or so. The battery requires cooling and you can see how the, the cabin performance uh, uh, degrades because part of the refrigerant is now uh, directed to the chiller to uh, to cool the battery. So being able to manage these trade-offs between uh, the requirements of battery, the requirements of the cabin, and these integrated thermal management systems is is complex and is really one of the key outputs from from trying to to build models like this. So, and that's uh, I think my last slide, and I'll hand it over to Stefan. Thank you, John. Um, so my name is Stefan Velu. I'm in charge of uh, the content that targets the energy sector. So I'll do as my colleagues did. I will start with a brief update on uh, uh, the library suite side, and then uh, I will highlight two applications. Uh, so first, um, yeah, I'd like to say we have a, um, a set of uh, libraries that can be used for uh, many different applications ranging from traditional technologies such as thermal power plants, 
uh, to emerging technologies like uh, energy storage systems, hydrogen, or uh, renewables. Uh, so now I'll go through uh, uh, the segments one by one. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so first concerning renewable energy systems, uh, so uh, I'd like to highlight the um, uh, up upgrade of the concentrating solar power system uh, model uh, in the thermal power library. Uh, so we made it flexible to be able to uh, uh, change the power cycle. Uh, it was originally uh, including, uh, or it was originally a runtime steam cycle. Uh, but now you can uh, change and look at, uh, um, uh, you can simulate using a supercritical CO2 uh, power cycle. Uh, then uh, we've also developed a new uh, component for PV. Uh, 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 last slide, thanks. Uh, new component for a PV panel. Uh, it's a detailed model that can be parameterized using supplier data. And it can uh, be uh, simulated uh, using a maximum power point tracking controller, or as it is uh, to, uh, study, uh, to design controllers for uh, control panels. Uh, then on the um, so next slide. So when it comes to um, uh, electrified systems and uh, uh, grid integration of, uh, let's say, EVs or renewables, uh, the new additions to the electrification library that uh, uh, John mentioned uh, can be uh, uh, used in uh, energy applications. So you can uh, use those new AC components uh, for uh, grid integration studies, uh, either for EVs or um, if you want to uh, um, study uh, or design control strategy for, uh, let's say, as an example, a solar power uh, EV charger, uh, as it is shown um, in the bottom right corner, combining components for electrification and from uh, thermal power level. Uh, so concerning uh, power and heat generation, um, so I've already mentioned the supercritical CO2 uh, Brayton cycle that uh, we will uh, also talk about in a, uh, at the Molecular Conference. Uh, so it is available as a standalone system model as well um, in the VaporCycle library. And uh, because of the regained interest in uh, carbon capture in the industry, we have migrated or um, a separation process package uh, to the thermal power library. And it has also been ex extended to include uh, models for adsorption columns um, uh, applicable for uh, flue gas treatment, but also direct air uh, capture. Um, so storage, so energy storage systems, this is a field where we've been uh, quite active uh, the latest uh, years, uh, especially in uh, uh, customer uh, projects. Uh, working uh, or designing, helping customers designing new types of uh, energy storage systems uh, and especially electrothermal storage. Uh, and we've also included a system model uh, of a, li a liquid air energy storage system uh, in the vapor cycle library that includes both the charging cycle to liquefy air and the discharge cycle to, um, uh, to gen generate power uh, by expanding it. Uh, at last, as last segment, um, so I'd like to highlight the, the addition um, um, to the thermal power library. Uh, so we have uh, added uh, optimization friendly microgrid models uh, that can be used to uh, simulate and optimize microgrids uh, and um, yeah, design energy management systems using um, the, the engine available in uh, model impact for dynamic optimization. So this is a, actually a workflow I'd like to highlight. Um, next slide. Uh, that is uh, available uh, in model impact. 
uh, optimal design and control of microgrids. Uh, so uh, using those models I mentioned, uh, you can in model an impact um, uh, first create a microgrid uh, model by drag and drop of those uh, components in the thermal fiber library. Uh, so then the next step would be to import or predict data for weather load uh, and uh, electric electricity cost. So here to the right, you see uh, a model that uh, predicts the irradiation, uh, sun irradiation based on your location. Uh, you see a table um, or that the load data is imported using a table and then you have some uh, arbitrary uh, cost profile. Then the next step is to define the optimization problem uh, that includes also uh, that includes cost function, but also inequality constraints if you have any uh, environmental or operational constraints to account for. So for that we have uh, an optimizer uh, block um, that uh, that is used by the end user to specify any um, uh, yeah, cost function involving the uh, model variables. And then at last, so we, uh, we apply uh, algorithms uh, for um, solving the dynamic optimization problem uh, over a given time horizon. And this can be used for either solving operational problem, design problem, uh, problems, or the combination of both. Um, so next slide. Uh, so we have uh, provided the end user with a, a predefined set of design and operation problems. So here, as an example, you see uh, pure operational problems like economic dispatch, where you try to minimize the operational cost of running the assets. Demand charge reduction is uh, another operational uh, problem where you want to uh, minimize the peak uh, from grid import uh, when having a, a, a given set of uh, assets. Peak shaving, PV sizing, generator sizing are um, design problems, but that do not assume any uh, control strategies. So there we solve uh, both a simultaneous control and a design problem. Uh, you can formulate and solve those uh, problems uh, from different uh, environments. So first you have the model centric view. Uh, uh, in, um, uh, here you see a screenshot uh, from the main uh, graphical user interface in model and impact, uh, where you can both um, uh, or build a microgrid model, uh, define cost function and run uh, the problem. Uh, for, let's say, less technical uh, users, uh, we offer the web app uh, as a way of deploying the workflows to a larger audience. And then finally, for uh, advanced users um, uh, willing to design workflows and adapt the existing ones, uh, we offer the notebook view uh, with uh, Python scripting. Uh, Finally, so I'd like to highlight uh, another workflow uh, that is using the, uh, the solvers for steady state that uh, both John and Michael mentioned before. Uh, but here, this is uh, used for energy applications. So uh, we can use the uh, steady state solver um, to um, to solve for both of design and on design uh, problems. And we actually use uh, our dynamic models. Uh, so we use the same models for both dynamic simulation and steady state simulation. So here in this screenshot, you see uh, a system model for a heat recovery steam generator. Uh, and uh, in that formulation, uh, we solve, uh, we design Simultaneously, uh, the three heat exchangers, uh, the superheater, the, uh, the evaporator, and the economizer uh, uh, in a specific, uh, for a specific set of boundary conditions that are defined at, uh, at the system level. So with that, um, I think I am done for the energy update. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. And 
yeah, ready to answer questions you may have.